You are listening to the IFH Podcast Network. For more amazing filmmaking and screenwriting podcasts, just go to ifhpodcastnetwork.com. Welcome to the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast, episode number 149. I would rather have a mind opened by wonder than one closed by belief. Jerry Spence. Broadcasting from a dark, windowless room in Hollywood, when we really should be working on that next draft. It's the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast, showing you the craft and business of screenwriting while teaching you how to make your screenplay bulletproof. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, welcome to another episode of the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Now, today's show is sponsored by Bulletproof Script Coverage. Now, unlike other script coverage services, Bulletproof Script Coverage actually focuses on the kind of project you are and the goals of the project you are. So we actually break it down by three categories, micro-budget, indie film market, and studio film. There's no reason to get coverage from a reader that's used to reading tentpole movies when your movie's going to be done for $100,000. And we wanted to focus on that at Bulletproof Script Coverage. Our readers have worked with Marvel Studios, CAA, WME, NBC, HBO, Disney, Scott Free, Warner Brothers, The Blacklist, and many, many more. So if you need your screenplay or TV script covered by professional readers, head on over to CoverMyScreenplay.com. And today's show is also sponsored by the Heart Chart Screenwriting Masterclass taught by legendary screenwriter James V. Hart, the writer of Bram Stoker's Dracula, Hook, and Contact, to name a few. His unique story mapping system will teach you how to get your script ready for production and the marketplace. To gain instant access, head over to bulletproofscreenwriting.tv forward slash heart chart. That's H-A-R-T chart. Now, guys, today on the show, we are going to go into wonder, specifically tracking your wonder, opening your creative juices up, and connect with your inner child, the thing that keeps you creative, the thing that artists like Steven Spielberg has been able to do throughout his career to to stay in touch with that inner child. And today's guest is the person to do that. Today on the show, we have best-selling author Jeffrey Davis, who is the writer behind the new book, Tracking Wonder, Reclaiming a Life of Meaning and Possibility in a World Obsessed with Productivity. And Jeff and I had a fantastic conversation about the creative process, and how you can tap into that well of creativity to get into the flow of things, to understand where your creative well lives and how you understanding wonder and tracking wonder in your life will allow you to be more creative in any kind of creative endeavor you do, regardless if it's creative or even in business or in life in general. And it's a really It was a really eye-opening conversation, so without any further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Jeffrey Davis. I'd like to welcome to the show Jeffrey Davis. How are you doing, Jeffrey? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm doing great, my friend. I'm doing great. Uh, I I really wanted to have you on the show because I I need some wonder in my life. Uh, I need to track some of that wonder. And I need to use it to uh, to help me in my creative path, as well as not only creative path, but honestly, uh, your soul's path in so many ways, just like your your life's journey. So um, I have to ask you, how did you get started um, in this field of work? Yeah, yeah, this field of work at Tracking Wonder, right? It's the name of my <laughs> company and consultancy. Like, how do you do that? So, um, yeah, I'll, I'll just start off. Briefly, we can talk about, you know, more more what is wonder and what I've come to discover about the nature of these experiences of wonder after 15 plus years of deliberate research into it. Um, you know, currently I'm a I'm a strategist and consultant and um, and that's often been my line of work for for quite some time. And over 15 years ago. I was researching another project related to creativity and the creative process, came across a book, a little known book of yoga philosophy, and uh, it kind of really opened me up. And I'll just say briefly, that was kind of the moment of inspiration because it just the commentary said something about the nature of reality might be like this ordinary waking world and this 
world of the interior world of the dreams and, and mind that we have. Mm-hmm. And when you can experience ultimate reality um, right here in this ordinary world, then you're characterized quite often by wonder or a sort of joy-filled amazement. And so when I read that, that was a moment of inspiration for me because I realized I had been looking for much of my life for those sets of experiences, those sets of experiences where you feel fully alive and like this is it in this ordinary world (laughs) without Mm -hmm. having to seek transcendence or some other reality. Yeah. So that was a moment of inspiration. I then devoted a lot of my work toward researching and taking some deep dives into these experiences of wonder. This is 2004, so there's very little science of wonder available. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't know that I, there, there was any. There was any, period. <laughs> there, there was actually some science of awe just starting. And so I was uh, talking with some of those psychologists, like Dr. Keltner mm-hmm. at a UC Berkeley, who actually confers with Pixar Studios that makes on the sense. science of awe now. So there was a little science of awe, but very little, yes, on the science of wonder. And uh, so, but I was taking some deep dives in some other areas, trying to make some some connections uh, about wonder, kind of an intellectual journey. And then a few years later, after experiencing just a set of personal adversity, uh, within a year of my wife and I getting married and buying our dream house, uh, farmhouse in the Hudson Valley of New York, uh, we had a house fire. I had Lyme disease. Uh, oh. um, the, the, the fire put us out of our house for 15 plus months. Um, we ended up having uh, a baby in that 15 months, our first <laughs> baby. There was just like a number of things that was just like a domino effect. But I did what I did and I got really curious um, about what was going on with me in tandem with my explorations of wonder. So this is the kind of the defining moment, you know, to your question. This was a set of inflection points for me. In that period, I got really curious about the relationship between our experiencing adversity, constant challenge, constant change, and whether or not experiences of wonder could help us not only navigate that adversity, but ultimately flourish in that adversity. So I committed a lot of my research and a lot of my delivery to my, my clients with that framework in mind. And I'll just say in brief, part of my discovery and, and part of the premise of the book, Tracking Wonder, is that when we look at what I call fulfilled innovators, people who have really contributed to their fields, but who describe their lives as being fulfilled, not burnt out, their surprising advantage is not necessarily 10,000 hours of deliberate practice or grit or wealth or some DNA genius talent. It is actually they have maintained an abiding sense of wonder. And that's what I've continued to test out. And further now with the emerging science of wonder in the past six years, I've corroborated that hypothesis. There's there's one... um director that I always look at that, uh, that has that sense of wonder is that Steven Spielberg. Oh yeah. Yeah. Steven Spielberg is one of those guys who, who just, you could just tell, even though he's not making his, his, I mean, his films that he's been making recently in the last, let's say 10, 15 years have been more serious, more grown up tackling like Lincoln and Munich and other things like that. But there's always a sense of wonder in the stuff that he does. And he's maintained that wonder throughout his career. You're absolutely right. So Spearberg's early work is definitely wonder driven very specifically. And just with what I said, it's wonder in this ordinary world, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm curious about the Harry Potter movies in part because I have a 12 year old daughter who's really interested in them and the Harry Potter stories. But what I, the reason I'm less interested in those is because there's some other sort of warlock world out there. You know, I'm really interested in the magic among the muggles, <laughs> among the ordinary people. But you're absolutely right. Steven Spielberg, Wes Anderson, 
is oh. another one who is uh, constantly full of wonder, who can sometimes take on serious subjects satirically, but also wondrously. Yeah, and it's it's interesting as you start going down the list of filmmakers um, or just creatives in general in whichever field, the people who are at their highest level, they all s- seem to have a sense of wonder of what they do, uh, of awe almost. And Pixar is a great example of that. I mean, Pixar is, uh, you know, without without a doubt, one of the, the, the best track records in history of yeah. of wonder within their their storytelling. So when you said, oh, yeah, I think we were talking about earlier that, um, you know, you, you, you've you interviewed people or have talked to people from Pixar, from animation, that world seems to have so much more wonder than normal Hollywood or normal storytelling in many ways. In many ways. And yeah, so you know, part of my interviews uh, with innovators in so many different areas in my research, in, including filmmakers like Mark Osborne, who Mm -hmm. directed uh, Kung Fu Panda. He also um, directed the audacious remake of The Little Prince, the most adored story in all of France. Mm -hmm. Uh, And he he had to do it very differently. It was beautiful. It was beautiful. I saw it. Incredible remake. You know what I'm talking about. I saw it. Yeah, I saw it. It It's beautiful. So beautiful. And I asked him, so he said, um, you know, Every animated making every animated film is like a nightmare, which is not unlike what Ken Burns also says. So Ken, uh, you know, amazing documentary filmmaker, uh, says that every documentary is like a million problems. Mm-hmm. So if you know that, right? So let's just pause there for a moment because one of the premises of the book Tracking Wonder and my body of work, this is what I tell everybody I work with. Every big idea begets a series of challenges. Mm -hmm. So you have a great idea for a film. It's like, yeah, let's make this film. This sounds great. Well, that's fine. But just know that that's going to beget a series of challenges. So you normalize that. So the question is for Mark Osborne or Ken Burns or Alex or anybody is like, what is going to get you and your team through? those series of challenges without burning out and without burning bridges. Now, (laughs) one thing I, I, one thing I remember about myself when I was younger is my sense of wonder was a lot more than it is today. Uh, And I'm not talking about when I was a child, I was talking about like, even when I was in my early twenties at film school or, you know, have my new first job and, and everything seemed wondrous to me. Like, oh my God, is that a machine that edits? What is that? What is that camera? What is it? Every, every little part of the process for me was wondrous. And yet, um, as you get older, you, you become more cynical and you kind of lose that wonder a bit. And those moments that I've always found happiness is when I reconnect to that wonder, wherever that, that wonder might be. And I think it's something that comes and we're born innately with that and the world beats it out of us. Is that a fair statement? It's in part true. Um, so I, I so appreciate that you that you acknowledge that about your earlier self. I think that's true for most of the people I work with. Certainly it's been true for myself. Um, so if I could, I, I'll elaborate just a bit on you know, what, why does wonder wane, right? Mm-hmm. We, every human being is born wide-eyed with wonder. <laughs> and certain can, cultural anthropologists corroborate this, that we human beings in part uniquely are born wide-eyed with wonder. We're perhaps here, some mm-hmm. evolutionary biologists are suggesting to wonder. So the question is, why do we lose it, as you're, as you're saying? It's in part neurological. At about 12 or 13 years old, you remember that time? Mm-hmm. It was like the time I called like the lowest ring of the inferno <laughs> for myself. <laughs> it's like really <laughs> hard years. And so, it was pretty, so, oh yeah, puberty so, sucks. Puberty sucks. Yeah, yeah, uh, it's hard. You know, <laughs> uh, my twelve-year-old daughter is navigating it grace graciously so far, but far better than I did. So, but what's happening neurologically, even for her, is her synapses are pairing out. She's not making as many synaptical connections. And so not everything seems so amazingly new anymore already, right? right? That just is natural neurologically. The other part is in part social and, and cultural. We start becoming self-conscious, how we're being sized up with other people. 
Um, it's also cultural, Alex. I mean, we swim in a culture in this country that prizes productivity to a fault and daydreaming and wondering doesn't appear productive. Although I could argue and demonstrate why it ultimately is, but it certainly doesn't appear that way. Right. So that's a part of it too. Now what you identified as a young filmmaker is the novelty part of that wide eyed wonder, right? Wonder has several facets that I explore in the book. But one is that wide-eyed openness, mm -hmm. right? When things are new, when the ideas are new, when the equipment's new, and like, oh my gosh, I'm going to be a filmmaker. And you're right, if we're not careful, we can become jaded. We can become cynical. We can become, we can approach the world as been there, done that. Oh yeah, tell me something I don't already know. Mm -hmm. That whole mindset is self-defeating and it's clearly wonder defeating. Yeah. So, so to answer your question, yes, it's all of that and, and more, right? It's not that the world beats it out of us. It's that the, the world we've inherited does not necessarily support us as wondering grownups. But I will argue that wonder is not kid stuff. It is radical, really important grownup stuff. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I've, I had friends of mine, very good friends of mine who worked at Disney Animation. And I would walk into Disney Animation and I would just see people playing video games. They would have like full rooms set up with video games and arcades and whatever, you know, basketball nets and things that are absolutely nothing to do pr with productivity. Uh, because it allowed their juices to flow and allowed that, I guess, sense of wonder, that creativity to 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 come through. And when I saw that, I was like, this is amazing. This is remarkable. And now they have that in the tech companies and, you know, Google and Apple and those. They, they have those kind of environments now where it's not the cubicle, sit down, do your job nine to five. Yes, those worlds exist. But those companies, I find, don't aren't nearly as productive as, I mean, I just mentioned it, Google, Apple, I mean, Disney, these are, these are top of their industry kind of companies and they're letting their, their employees just kind of goof around, quote unquote, goof around, but they realize the benefit of allowing yourself, even if you're working at home, allowing yourself time to wonder, time to reconnect with that child and and I go back to Spielberg because he said it so much I've talked to so many people who've worked with him over the years and they said it's like seeing a child on set and a lot of these big directors a lot of these big screenwriters uh, and filmmakers uh, and other people in other in other fields they seem to be able to connect to that at will and that's their superpower boy you just said it so uh I love that you're making these connections. Ron Howard, I think, is another one I've oh, heard as well. Love, right? yeah. Ron, <laughs> Ron, yeah. Ron, yeah. Ron is, he's, yeah, I've, I've, had, I've, I've spoken to a few people who've worked with him, and he's just like this child on set. And he, you could see it in their eyes, and the actors love working with these because they start feeling like, oh, I'm at home dressing up for my parents to put on a show. And when you can connect to that energy as an adult, it's extremely powerful because we all watching that on a subconscious level are yearning for that, that those good times, if those were good times for you, but to go yeah. back to that moment of wonder, to go back to believing uh, in all the things that we believed in when we were children, it was just such a, you know, not nostalgia, but it's just something that connects you to that source, whatever and you so want to use it, yeah. use it. No, you so hit it. And, and right. Yeah. Our childhoods are complicated. And I do watch my two <laughs> girls and my younger one. I think, wow, childhood's actually really confusing. Like, oh. <laughs> nothing's nothing's at your scale, you know, <laughs> nothing sized for you and so right. forth. Like it's really confusing. You're learning these crazy rules that these crazy giants have set up for you and so forth. <laughs> but so you've hit it on so many tracks. So um there's actually a uh, an essay I, I often go back to is written in the late 1800s by a poet and uh, art critic named Charles Baudelaire. And he was looking at the artwork of, of this artist, Constantine Guise, who had just started painting in his 60s, I think, you know, started pretty late and was naively trained, not formally trained, exhibiting some of his early work in Paris, like the art center of the world. And he's writing this essay about 
Constantine Giza, sort of like a portrait of the future modern artist, uh, sort of forcing the 20th century. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. And what he was recognizing in Guise, who Guise wasn't drawing or, or painting the sort of common romantic figures of the heroic past. He was painting ordinary women and people on the streets and sidewalks right around him. And so, so Baudelaire, to like something you said a minute ago, Baudelaire says about Guise and about painters in general and about us in general is that genius – is the capacity to retrieve childhood at will. Genius ah. is the capacity to retrieve childhood at will, which is exactly what you're getting on. And so, um, not to get too philosophical for your audience, but I'm sure there are lots of, you know, if this is a film audience, uh, mm -hmm. I can go a little philo philosophical. Um, so genius. So I've studied philosophy for a long time too. And in Greek philosophy among Aristotle and others, Genius, the word, the Greek word for genius is daemon. And so Aristotle and others contended that we're each born with a daemon, this unique force of character that is unique to every one of us. You know, Steven Spielberg has his, Ron Howard has his, Alex has his, I have mine. The thing is, we're born forgetting what that unique force of character is. And occasionally in certain moments, you will remember it. Occasionally in certain moments, maybe a mentor will reflect back to you something innately talented in you that you don't quite see in yourself. So one thing I have teams do is actually recall moments when they might have been seven or eight, nine or 10 years old before some of that neuronal pairing and recall certain moments when you felt alive and free to be distinctly you without regard for reward or recognition. And when you really delve into those memories in sensory ways, maybe even write about them, you will remember certain traits about sort of your young genius, so to speak. And the evidence is showing that when you do that, when you actually recall those moments, share those moments, and then actively bring forward some of those traits to your work at hand. I like just imagine if you recalled that young genius every morning mm -hmm. and wrote down, say, three of those traits of your young genius every morning and then looked at your schedule and said, how am I going to bring one or more of those traits with me today at work? Things change. And I've seen it happen over and over again that somebody who feels like they've lost that sense of wonder starts to up their wonder ratio. It's not like you go through the whole day like Peter Pan, God forbid, <laughs> but you, you do up your wonder ratio and you maintain some of that idealism, but in a pragmatic way. Yeah, there's, there's a thing I always say um, when, I'm, when I'm speaking, I, um, I always tell people, how many here uh, know an angry and bitter filmmaker? And then people would people would raise their hands or screenwriter and they would raise their hands. And I go, whoever didn't raise your hand, you are the angry and bitter filmmaker that everybody else knows <laughs> because it's just the way it is. What, in your opinion, causes, you know, you know, we're using the we're using filmmaking as a as an example. But they're in any field, whether it be yeah. opening a business, writing a book, you know, being an, an actor or a painter or anything. Um what is it that causes us to lose that hope, lose that wonder of what got us started in the first place and turns us into those angry and bitter souls walking around the planet who we have to deal with on Twitter? <laughs> yeah, that's a tough. It's a tough question. It's yeah. really a tough question. You know, part of my job, I feel like, is to keep open and wondering about our fellow human beings, especially right. the ones and the behaviors that so puzzle me, like mm -hmm. the trolls, right? Mm -hmm. And and yes, very bitter people. And I've had some of them. And I'm <laughs> often like, I'm like, hmm, how can I, how can I get through a little bit? And I often will succeed by just like acknowledging, okay, they're coming from some some place, some dark yeah. place. Yeah. That has nothing to do with you. It has nothing has to do with you. Nothing to do with me, right? I always have to remember it has nothing to do with it's me. It's not personal. It's like, how can I get through here? 
you know, through Twitter, which is, you know, this strange medium. And sometimes, you know, sometimes that can succeed and get a little opening and connection between us. That is a complicated question. I don't know if I can answer it, but I will say this. Certainly, excessive trauma, betrayal, crisis upon crisis right. leads to it. But one of the facets of wonder, one of the six facets of wonder that I lay out in tracking wonder, and this comes after a lot of research, is the facet of hope. And I have to admit my own bias against hope before I really dug into the science of, of hope uh, with Shane Lopez and some other psychologists. I had a bias against hope because it sounded sort of like, oh, you're just hoping, you know, you got maybe false hope, you're delusional, mm -hmm. something like that. Sort of wishful thinking. It turns out that the facet of hope is not wishful thinking. It's very proactive. So I can't completely answer what it is that leads a certain individual to completely lose hope after crisis, after trauma and so forth. But I will maybe tell a story about Nick Cave since we're talking to a creative audience here. Um, Nick, uh, for those listeners who don't know, is a phenomenal, uh, he's probably the most renowned musician in all of Australia. He's a bard, singer, songwriter. Um, the Bad Seeds have been his band for, for a few decades. Um, I think one of his, his musical scores has been on a Harry Potter film again. Um, so, so Nick, uh, uh, like his muse just doesn't stay in any, any one lane either. I think he's, he's published novels as well. 2000, uh, he married his wife, Susie, and, uh, they had twin sons. And he said in an interview around 2000 that he became a nine to five man. His muse like would come to work at nine was off at five because he wanted to be full on as a father and husband and, and so forth, have a kind of integrated life. He was very successful that way and, and kind of operating that way. Um, it's quite often how I uh, function and flourish too. I have to like bring my muse on at, at will. So, um, in 2015, the sons are 15 years old. One of them falls off a chalk cliff uh, while they're on vacation and falls to his death at 15 <sighs> years old. And as somebody who's a father of a 12-year-old and a 7-year-old yeah. daughter, like that is just, I can't really fathom what he went through. Um, so what, what, what possibly gets us out of that crisis, out of that darkness when the world has gone so bleak and, and dark. And as it, it did for him, as you can imagine, and for Susie as well, he said he was just completely off centered and completely, of course, self-absorbed. Like they couldn't just imagine why this happened to them. And it took a while to get out of that. And there were a couple of, I think, central pieces to his story about what brought him hope again. One was community. Um, his community of fans reached out to him. So he started a blog called The Red Hand Files, where he writes these intimate letters to people who are um, asking him uh, questions. And that support network is really important for us when we're experiencing crisis and adversity or trauma mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to surround ourselves with other hopeful people genuinely hopeful people give us real encouragement, not just bad advice. And, uh, so the other piece though, Alex, he says in the very first blog on red hand file, somebody says, how are you getting through this incredible grief and, and mourning? What's getting you through? How are you able to create again? So he says in that opening blog, he said, you know, we had lost our center. What was our center? Well, for me, and probably for most creative people, if not all human beings, it's a sense of wonder. And the trauma completely divorced us from that sense of wonder, he said. Um, and so we had to go through our mourning and through our grief and gradually find our, back, our way back to the creative process. He mm -hmm. couldn't stick to a nine to five process. It was messy, so messy. But he gradually started to string together a few chords, a few lyrics, and ultimately created, Alex, an incredible album that I would recommend to all of your listeners called Ghost Teen. And it really illustrates how Oof. wonder can meet you on the other side of grief. So 
it was a long way of not answering your question. I can't say what leads somebody to be so dark and, and cynical and so forth. But right. I suspect, and it's been my experience with such people, that there is still a glimmer and a desire for wonder on the other side. Um, and if they can surround themselves with other people who are hopeful, and if they can just move a little more forward towards something creatively, they will have more light than dark along the way. Now, when, when we talk about wonder, we're, we're also talking about connecting to creativity, creating, uh, and that creativity could be obviously in the arts, but that also could be in business. That could also be in any, you know, in architecture, it could be in a million different fields. Um, how do you use wonder to tap into creativity or does creativity just begin to flow? I always, I always talk to, um, a lot of these high performing um, people who who are able to get into the zone. It's a fascination of mine. I've been there a couple times. Oh, not, I've been there many times in my life, especially when you're creative, like you just lose track of time and and you're just flow and you're in the flow. You're just there. You don't even see what's coming in. Sometimes when I write my books, I'm sure you feel this as well. Um, when you're writing, you'll stop writing and you'll go back the next day and read what you wrote. And you're like, who wrote that? Like, I don't even, that who, this is good. Like, I don't, I don't even remember writing it. When you get to that place in your, in your thing, how does wonder, how can you use wonder to tap into that creativity? Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're intimately related. And so maybe a couple of definitions are useful. So, um, and I do address creativity full front, uh, in the early chapters of, of the book, creativity, we could define in the field of psychology as the capacity to generate and act on ideas, novel and useful ideas from fantasy to fruition, right? Mm -hmm. You've got a new idea for a film. You've got a new set of problems for the film or for the book or for the business. You're going to meet those challenges all along the way. Creativity is being able to face and finesse each of those challenges and generate novel and useful solutions and then move forward with them. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's part of the creative process. And it's not always so flow. Uh, Mihai Chik sent me high. Actually, the you know, the one who coined flow just died last week at 87 oh. years old. Wow. And so he, you know, he did not define flow as being in a state of relaxation. Right? <laughs> no, no, no. He, he clearly acknowledged like it is often involving taking on voluntary challenges like filmmaking or starting a business, business or yeah. up leveling, up leveling a business. Right. Mm -hmm. So the creative process is like, how do we face and finesse those challenges more expansively with a, a broader range of resources, both cognitively and socially to generate and move on those novel and useful solutions. Okay. That's creativity. Wonder. Let's define wonder. Right. So wonder is a, heightened state of awareness that's brought on by something that's unexpected, that defies your expectations, that either delights you, disorients you, or both. And for a fleeting moment, right, whether it's a, a bald eagle that suddenly lands in your backyard, which actually happened here last week, we couldn't believe it, um, that certainly was delightful and disorienting, whether it's something a colleague of yours says that helps you see that colleague in a new and beautiful way. You're like, wow, I never saw that part of that person. That's a moment of wonder as well. These moments of wonder disrupt our biased ways mm -hmm. of looking at a project, disrupt our biased ways of looking at a collaborator, disrupt our biased ways of seeing what we think is real. And something happens cognitively in our minds and neurologically that opens us up, right? To another possibility. So it turns out that these moments of wonder are essential both to starting the creative process, right, with a brand new idea and moving us through from curiosity to the middle stages of bewilderment, which is another facet of wonder, right? When we're in the middle of a project, we're thinking, I'm never going to get out of this. Like, why did I even start this project? All the way to forming really good connections with our collaborators um, 
wonder happens at every one of those stages throughout the creative process. Does that make sense? It makes it, yeah, it makes all the sense in the world because you know when you when I started this podcast, I'm sure you you feel the same way with your show. When I started this with all of my podcasts, when I start them, uh, especially the first one, I you know it was just like, hey, can I get a guest? Any guest, you know, someone who can come on. Uh, let me show you know. Let me start providing value to an audience that's not listening because uh, I was nobody at the time. <laughs> so you just and and as you go through that, um, I'll use the analogy of a podcast where you know you just keep doing it and keep doing it and keep showing up and keep doing it. And for me, I literally live in a mo- I live in a in a world of wonder every day with my show because every day I get an email from something, from somebody pitching a show um, or like yourself, or I have these amazing, ridiculous people who I've admired all of my life who call up and like, I'd love to be on your show. And I get to talk for a couple hours with a hero of mine. It's become almost, it's almost become normal now on the show. And everyone listening will understand why, because I've had these amazing guests coming on again and again and again and again. And it's been going like this now for the last, I don't know, year and a half. So it's just been growing and growing. And I just never really put a a name to it, but I'm in a moment, I'm I'm in a constant state of wonder because I'm waiting now for Steven Spielberg's people to call me. And Steven's like, Steven would love to be on your show. I'm waiting for that call. I'm not, it hasn't come yet. Um, But I'm waiting for that call to happen because that would just, you want to talk about disruptive. (laughs) It would just, it would completely, this like completely shake my world. And my world has been shaken multiple times over the course of the last year and a half by people calling me up like, hey, can I be on your show? And I'm like, what is going on? So I never really noticed that before. And then I, and then all the, all those connections and relationships that I've built open up other doors that are, ever since I started this whole show, I've been in a state of wonder because every day or every week something would come up. I'd be like, what the hell is going on? So it's constant. It is really constant. It's really interesting. I've never really put a name to it before. I love that you said that too. I never put a name to it because that was my experience back in 2004. It's like, oh my gosh, I think this is what I've been wanting since I was a toe headed boy, you know, wandering the woods or, and, um, and so I, I, I love that on so many levels, Alex, let me, let me kind of lay out for the listeners the six facets of wonder yes, please. and how they directly relate to this creative process and even your experience in developing the podcast. It's so, so uh, spot on what you've said. Um, so the, I, I think of these six facets in three pairs and the first pair are openness and curiosity. So openness is like what I call the wide sky facet of wonder. It is that radical openness to possibility that we want to foster, particularly at the onset of a new idea, a new chapter in our life, uh, when we just want to be, you know, we want to reclaim that sort of wide-eyed wonder that we were talking about. Curiosity is what I call the rebel facet of wonder because curiosity is very proactive. It's seeking new knowledge. It's, it's, it's when you you know, you got really curious once you moved into the podcast idea, like, okay, what's the best equipment? And like, who could I really get on here? And could I just set up a minimal viable experiment to like, see if this is going to work? All of that experimentation is part of curiosity. Curiosity also allows us to question the status quo, which makes it really important these days to foster Mm -hmm. true curiosity. So openness and curiosity are foundational to us being able to approach our life and work more creatively than reactively. Really important distinction there. The second pair are bewilderment and hope. And the, this pair, so bewilderment is what I call the deep woods facet of wonder. This is when we <laughs> get into that world of confusion. It's what much of the globe, frankly, has experienced for the past year and a half since mm-hmm. 2020 is a state of bewilderment. And if we're fortunate and we can put language to it, then we're like, okay, this is a normal state. Can I actually fertilize this confusion instead of pathologize it? Can I bring some curiosity forward into the deep woods? Um, And then there's hope. Hope is the rainbow facet of wonder. It's proactive. It is when we set our sights on just sometimes small near future goals. And it's where we do deliberately daydream to foresee 
a better possible future. And I saw a lot of literature on this during the pandemic that was actually advocating some deliberate daydreaming. Those two facets, bewilderment and hope, are essential for us developing resilience without hardening up, right? Grit mm -hmm. without burning out, right? Mm -hmm. Really, really important for us and our well-being, our mental and physical well-being. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. The third facets are connection and admiration. These, I think, may be the most important facets of wonder for our times. And they're not what we typically associate with wonder. But connection is the what I call the flock facet. It speaks to our yearning to sync up with one another on a film crew, right, and a dance troupe and a band or just on a team of collaborators. Um, and it's where we really can experience wonder with one another when we're feeling supported and buoyed and encouraged among one another. Admiration is the mirror facet of wonder and the actual root, the Latin root of the word, I'm kind of a word geek, the root of the word admiration is M-I-R-A, which is Latin for wonder. It is a part of wonder and it's kind of like what you feel for Spielberg mm -hmm. is what I would call maybe a surprising love for someone's excellence in craft mm -hmm. sure. or in character or both, right? Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. like, and it wakes something up in you mm -hmm. that's like, oh, I want to show up a little better in my character. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, 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 an under, that's a very big understatement, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> well, what I would say, too, possibly for you and your experience with your podcast is that it's possible that you have, and I mean this in a very genuine way, perhaps you've seen yourself differently, too, in the past year and a half. Like you've oh. recognized some things we are like whoa like i can show up and do like why are people coming to me like there must be something they're seeing in me too that all has to do with the facet of admiration so i hope that was helpful to you and your um, and your listeners no it, it it was without question i mean yeah i mean <laughs> to show up with <laughs> i love that you said that like <laughs> to show up a little bit a little bit better i promise you with mr spielberg shows up uh it's going to be a different conversation <laughs> No offense, obviously, with anybody else I speak to, but you know, I'm not. The, the funny thing is, I'm not the only one. I mean, there's a generation, uh, you know, of people who were raised with his films, and and he's one of the most famous human beings on the planet, who's not a star in front of the camera. He's he's you know he's like Hitchcock, you know, he's like one of those names that people know. So, you know, as for a film, I mean, and and in every field, there's that, you know, there. I mean, there in every field, yeah. if you're in the tech world, you want to talk to you know, Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos or, or you know, any of these guys um, who start up these things. So it's, every, there's always somebody for everybody. Um, can I want, can I want up the Spielberg thing? Well, obviously. And, and, and kind of speak to um, what you said, like I didn't have a word for wonder. I recognize too that um, before I had a word for it, when I look at the people I was drawn toward from my teenagehood, like why was I drawn toward these musicians? What was it? When I look at Spielberg that I was drawn to, uh, starting in the nineties, I recognize it was that element of wonder in his films. And I realized when I was really looking into Spielberg's history in his films, I thought, Oh, or I remembered when I was a boy, I saw on television, his <laughs> first student film duel with, I think Sam Weaver. You know? Yeah, It wasn't a, it wasn't a student film, but yes, it was, it was his okay. first, it was, his, it, was it was a TV movie. It was a TV movie. It was a TV movie. Movie. That wasn't it. that it wasn't supposed to go anywhere, but it was so good they released it theatrically because everyone was like, "What the hell's going on? <laughs> what is that?" Right? He completely just like changed everything. So, yeah. But I do. I, I uh, again, like I do remember like my early fascination with Spielberg, and later I realized it was like, oh, it was his sense of of wonder, right? Even um, even uh, in in Schindler's List. Right. That, oh. that use of color was in part his sense of where's the wonder amidst this devastating story. Yeah. Yeah. And even in, even in his later work that he's doing now, um, there's still senses of wonder, even in yeah. Lincoln, even Lincoln. in Lincoln. And absolutely. There's just a different it's just, you know, it doesn't all have to be Peter Pan, you know, yeah. running around. It, it's really interesting. Why do you I have to ask you, why do you think 
that wonder is looked at as being so childish, that daydreaming is looked upon being so childish. I know specifically here in the States, but I think worldwide, um, it, there's a little less variations depending on what country you're in and what cu- culture you come from. But generally speaking, you know, not, I don't, I don't, I don't know at least of any cultures or or countries that are just like, you know, what you need to go do, you need to just go daydream, and you need <laughs> like that's not something that happens. So Actually, why is it? Look- you know, I, I've spent some time in India, and and so. Uh, you know, and I, I referenced like um, there wasn't a lot of science of wonder in 2004. So what did I, I went to the philosophers? I went to the wisdom traditions of the East mm-hmm. with and I went to the poets and I've I've uh, published collections of poetry. I went to all those sources because they, of course, were advocating wonder in many ways because they got it. They understood it. Um, there are certain cultures um, that actually will promote. Uh, at least a wondrous state of being more so than others. I can speak specifically to the one that I have swum in all of my mm-hmm. life and inherited, and that's that's this one, uh, specifically in the United States. And part of the cultural heritage that we've inherited, whether we're part of this lineage or not, it in part goes back to in this country to um, – uh, a sort of Scottish Irish heritage related to the Protestant work ethic. Mm-hmm. Part of that um, lineage, you know, considered idleness the devil's playground. Yeah, idle hands. <laughs> yeah, idle hands is a devil's. Yeah, 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 right? yeah, yeah, the devil's playground, right? And so, um, so I just and so I, I I dug into this more uh, in Scotland in the 17th century. Uh, there was a an illness called the wonders. Uh, that was characterized by sort of numbness and just sort of gazing, sort of being in a stupor. This is part of what we have inherited. Like you can imagine, right? A boy out in the field and he's daydreaming and they're like, oh, look at that lad. He's not going to amount to anything, right? <laughs> but he turns out to be an innovator who may, may make labor conditions even better, you know, a generation later from his daydreaming. Um, so – in this culture too – so I've been looking at the history of work as I'm – you know, we're questioning – the nature of work now at Tracking Wonder. I've been looking at the history of work and and a fellow named, whose last name was Taylor in the turn of the 20th century, started to be one of the first organizational consultants, so to speak, who later influenced Henry Ford and, and others. Um, he was he was determined. He gave a talk in nine, nine, 1903 where he's like, you know, there's hardly a laborer alive, in, in, you know, in this country who's not always trying to scheme or figure out some way to make it appear as if he's working more than he actually is. Right? Mm-hmm. So, you know, then there was this whole perspective that like to be a successful company or a successful business, you needed to treat human beings as labors of unit, uh, as units of labor. Right. right? And your virtues were discipline, control, and speed, right? And so then the measurement of a worker's value was all related to efficiency and speed, right? Not daydreaming, not having Google's 20% off to like figure out- Innovate, innovate, yeah. Project, right? So this is all of what we've inherited. And it's certainly what we're questioning. It's certainly in part what the pandemic and other elements of the past year and a half have started to make us- question. But I can't help but tell you a recent story related to film that illustrates this point and part of its heritage in, in mm-hmm. Ireland. Uh, and part of my heritage is is from Ireland and Scotland. So um, apologies to any Irish, Irish listeners, <laughs> um, but they'll appreciate it, I think. So my daughters and I recently watched two films last week, both set in Ireland. One was uh, uh, Billy Elliot and the other oh. was Sing Street. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know those both? Right. Mm-hmm. They're both set in Ireland. They're both like, you know, and they're both of a um, Billy Elliot is a great illustration, <laughs> right? He's in Ireland, his father and his, and his older brother involved in the labor wars, you know, trying to get better conditions for labor. And Billy, here's Billy. He's Just wanting to, to dance to, to <laughs> dance and, and to dance ballet uh, of all things. Ballet? Ballet? Right? Yeah. You know? And so... But it is a beautiful story of just what we're talking about, a culture that does not support wonder. And yet what the most beautiful aspect of that story, of course, is how the father ultimately recognizes the beauty of his son's dancing and why it is how he really needs 
to flourish. So it's a long way of, of answering this question, right, that we we just inherited some of this paradigm, right, that, that mm. reduces wonder to child's play. The other thing is what we have to do, I would argue, Alex, is then test ourselves and our own minds and disrupt our own default assumptions about wonder, about ourselves and about each other, right? To just kind of check in and say, yeah, what is my, what is my view of wonder? Like, what is, like, could I actually see some parts of myself that are really hungering to be more creative, more imaginative, more caring mm -hmm. in my relationships? And, and, you know, have I kind of boxed myself in over the past 10 15, 20 years, right? To kind of disrupt my own default assumptions and not just blame the culture I've inherited. Yeah. 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 And that's, a, that's the thing we, there's, uh, look, I, I, you could imagine me speaking to my father, uh, who's a Cuban, who's a Cuban man who worked in a factory and I'm yeah. like, Hey, I'm going into the film business. And it's like, w what? Um, and to this day vaguely understands what I do. Um, 25, plus years later and he's been on set with me and he's like, I don't know what he does, but everyone listens to him on set. So, uh, <laughs> it's a great example, right? And so many people I've interviewed too, right. Who often come from, uh, first generation, uh, immigrant yeah, families, right? right. Face that, that conflict, right? Like, wait, we didn't come here to the United States for you to become a philosopher or, you know, or a musician or something like that. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's, it's crazy. I mean, if you look at, I mean, look, Steve Jobs, I mean, who created one of the, the biggest company in the world, who, who arguably was very full of wonder and, you know, he complicated gentleman to say the least, but he definitely had vision and was tapped into stuff that nobody else was. No one else saw yeah. a lot of the stuff that he saw and he saw it five, six steps before anybody else did. Uh, I mean, one of his most, one of jobs uh, most common consistent muses was the, um, 18th century poet, William Blake. Uh, yeah. And Blake, you know, I can't, I can't recite it, unfortunately right now. I, I used to a long time ago, but you know, Blake and, and some of the poems that jobs would carry around were so, sort of like being able to see, um, um, eternity in an hour. Uh, right. Uh, you know, Blake just had these visionary poems really of being able to see wonder. Blake would talk about how uh, most of us human beings experience reality through narrow caverns. Mm -hmm. Right. But we occasionally can break out of those caverns of reality to experience infinity in the present. Yeah. And the other book that he had, the only book he had on his iPhone an iPad when he died was autobiography of a yogi, uh, um, you know, by Yogananda. So that's, yeah. I mean, talk about wonder that book will, that book will mess you up <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> in the best way possible <laughs> without question. Now in your book, do you have some examples of people using wonder to kind of build lives or to do extraordinary things? In, in every, in every chapter, so there are six facets of wonder that I laid out for you. There is an unchapter. There is an unchapter that we intentionally did not number that actually the designer surprised me. It sounds true and published sideways. There is a sideways chapter where you actually have to read <laughs> the book sideways, right? And they did just some incredible <laughs> work design wise. And so that's the chapter on your young genius uh, and your young genius. I talk about Ariana Huffington. Um, in, in other chapters. And another one I talk about, uh, Tracy Fullerton, who's an amazing innovator in video games. Uh, Nick Cave, I um, recount part of that story in the chapter on hope. But there are both what I would call exemplary geniuses of creativity whose stories I tell in a variety of industries and everyday geniuses of creativity. And these are people in our international community at Tracking Wonder. They're people I've worked with. They're people like Evelyn Asher, who is 80 years old, who is still working hard. And she reclaimed her young genius just a few years shy of 80 years old to completely revive her business, right? Wow. And it's those everyday geniuses of creativity over the years who have taught me so much 
about the real applications and the real necessity of wonder in our times. Now, what are some tools or exercises that creatives, you know, filmmakers, screenwriters, uh, anybody listening can can tap into to use to tap into that that sense of wonder if you've become that angry and bitter person? How do you get out of the darkness? How do you see the light, Jeffrey? <laughs> wow okay no pressure no pressure how do you come towards the light jeffrey no. <laughs> yeah no I, I i appreciate that so the book actually every chapter also includes some specific tools uh and it, I, I tried to be very generous in that aspect as well and we can start actually uh, sort of foundational practice is uh what i call dose d o s e E, that then we can apply very specifically. So D is detecting your default pattern of thinking about something or of reacting to a surprise or challenge, right? So your default ways of trying to solve a problem or advance a business or think about your podcast, can you detect what that default pattern is? Can you detect your confirmation bias? And can you just kind of feel Right. So O stands for open up, pause and just feel that reaction or that default pattern. And then S stands for seek out wonder, seek out some different um, possibility. And I'll give you some examples in a moment. And then E stands for extend, which means to really appreciate and reflect upon whatever possibility or moment of wonder or surprise that you actively sought out. So this can go to the level of how you shape your days for more wonder and openness on a daily basis. Your default pattern in the morning. Many people I know check their phones first thing in the morning mm -hmm. for text and emails. It's like a default addictive thing. That's detecting the pattern. And, and when you notice that, just like detect it, open up to him like, oh, how does this feel? Like, not so great. Like, it puts me in a state of reactivity and I'm just allowing other things to stimulate my curiosity instead of me directing it. So could I just feel that and then seek out something different? Instead of checking my phone every morning, could I just actually get up and step outside for three minutes and look up at the sky for just a moment and see how that helps me feel? And then could I extend and like, just write, three minutes about what that experience was like. So you're shifting your default patterns. This is core to being a grown up, right? That is, is really fostering wonder. There are other things you can do then to disrupt your patterns morning, afternoon, and evening. We, um, we lay out some of what we call wonder interventions for, for teams and for individuals. So during the day, you and I, I'm sure, can work really hard and just get stuck. It's not really flow. It's just like work hard and get through your to-do list, right? Right, right. That's not real flow. So we know um, cognitively and psychologically we can only focus for so long optimally. Mm -hmm. So to work well, we have to break better. So how could we break better? So we have teams actually take wonder walks for five minutes. The science out of Stanford is overwhelming for why this benefits your creativity and why it reboots your focus. So is there something you could do to just kind of disrupt your work patterns? Could you take a break and just have a curiosity conversation with somebody to open up? In the evening, rather than default and check out and numb out, that turns out to be, Alex, when you are tired and fatigued in the afternoon or evening, one of your best opportunities to generate new and novel useful ideas. So rather than numbing out or, or checking out, it's a time to maybe take that meandering walk, but also to reflect on, okay, what were three good highlights today? I can tell you at the end of this uh, uh, of today, mm -hmm. this conversation I've had with you will actually be a highlight. It's been very surprising. I appreciate it. all in the direction I anticipated, <laughs> which I've loved. I just love being in the open moment with you, really. Yeah. I had no idea we we're going to talk about Spielberg and, and so forth, right? <laughs> and so I will look back at the end of this day and I will actually write a few things about this experience. Why? Because that reflection will be will increase the meaning in my life. We make meaning in part by reflecting on these sorts of moments. And so we have teams do this sort of activity as well to recognize the meaning that happens sometimes in the margins of our work, 
that help us work better. There's um there, there's one thing, and I wanted to just go a little bit deeper on on a certain thing that because we're talking about creativity, and I always love asking uh, high performing individuals who are creative in every field, you know, that they in whatever they do, um, where it comes from, mm-hmm. like where does this creativity come from? Where is that thing and i was talking to someone who um on on my other show that uh had the i love this story it is i I keep repeating the story because it's so beautiful he was heartbroken um he moved he he went on a job to india in the 60s 63 if i'm not mistaken and his girlfriend broke up with him while he was over there he was heartbroken he didn't know what to do and someone said you should go try some meditation We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. And he goes and he goes to um, to this ashram where this yogi is teaching meditation. And he gets to the front door and he's like, I'm here to learn meditation. I'm, like, I'm sorry, the ashram's closed. And he goes, why is the ashram closed? He goes, the Beatles are here. Uh, and I'm like, and he's like, what? He's like, yeah, the Beatles are here. Um... And we're close. He's like, and he tells him the story. He's like, look, I can't let you in now. Why don't you just stay? I'll bring you food and you can sleep in one of our tents outside the door. And he did. He stayed there for eight days until finally, like on the eighth day, he just, he would just stay there because he had nowhere else to go. And he was obviously needing of help. They let him in. They go, come in. I'll teach you how to meditate. They taught him how to meditate. They taught him TM meditation. Mm-hmm. Um, and then right after he was full of this, um, amazing, you know, euphoria after meditating mm-hmm. for the first time, he's going out and he goes, go meet the others at the table. And he's walking and there's John, Paul, George, and Ringo with his wives and, and, and girlfriends. And as he's walking, he's still in a blissful state, but his heart rate starting to, starting to, to, to go faster and faster and faster. And he's starting to realize as he's walking towards it, like, oh my God, it's the Beatles. And for people listening, the Beatles in 1963, 64 were the biggest human, the most famous human beings on the planet. They're, everybody knew who they were. And he was about to go sit down with them at a table privately. And, uh, and, and I never forgot what he said. He said the little voice inside of his head, and you can say wherever it came from, but the wor- little wor- voice inside of his head said, Hey, calm down. They're human beings. They fart and are scared of the dark. (laughs) Completely. (laughs) And they all think they're imposters. (laughs) Right. So, but what, what I found for, what I found about, I found out from talking to him was when he was talking to, cause he actually saw them for, I think he stayed there for like eight, nine days and saw them writing like, Hey Jude, (laughs) And, and, and like an album of theirs, I forgot which album was, I think it was after Sgt. Pepper, I'm not sure, but it was, it wasn't the white album. It might've been the white part of the white album. I don't remember, but it was like these amazing songs and he was just there taking pictures of them. Um, not that he was a professional photographer. He just happened to have a camera and was taking pictures of them. And he noticed something about their openness, their sense of wonder. I mean, being there meditating on a daily basis with, with this, um, with this yogi and, that's a sense of wonder, but anyone I've talked to who's been around Sir Paul, Sir Paul McCartney or Ringo Starr or any of them say the same thing. There is this lightness of energy around them. There is this openness to ideas that they were able, because, I mean, you can't argue with the output of what the Beatles did when they all four of them were in flow for, for a long, long time. They tapped into something that consistently for decades, for a couple decades at least. That was the magical part of it. So for again, this is a long question. <laughs> so I just wanted to tell you that story. But I always wonder, and I'd love to hear what you think about where you think your creativity comes from, where, where that thing when you're writing the book and you lose yourself in the writing process and you don't even recognize the words that are coming out of, of your fingers, where that comes from in your opinion. Yeah. So I actually want to demystify flow and creativity a little bit because 
a lot of my process in writing this book was like pacing, um, talking to myself, um, sort of like knocking my head up against the wall, all of which I would describe as part of flow. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, Mm -hmm. um, so inspiration, um, you know, the root of which is like to, to be breathed in, to breathe. Right. And, and so, yeah. So uh, your question was like, what are the origins of, of well, the muse, like the yeah, Greeks the use the, the, the Greeks use the muse that the muse would come in and whisper something yeah. in your ear. Yeah. But there's people that I've continued to study over my work over the years that, and I've been studying high performers since I was in high school. I've been reading books about, and all of them seemed, even scientists seem to be able to tap into that well effortlessly for a period of time. Not many do it for their entire life, but for a period of time, moments, they're able to tap into that. What Absolutely. is yes. what I, is I, that I, thing? I, I teach a course <laughs> that like 8,000 people have taken around the world called Deepen Your Focus and Flow mm-hmm. at Work, mm-hmm. right? So it's incremental. Um, I don't know what the source of that sort of spark is. Um, because I think it can be so defeating for people who don't necessarily experience that to Mm -hmm. sort of, sort of chase after it. But I will say this, I, um, if it's true that all wisdom begins in wonder, all true knowledge begins in not knowing, I really do think that wonder actually begins in our human relationship with the natural world. I would contend that it is our human capacity to be attuned to and to actually perceive patterns in nature, including Steve Jobs and others, that actually gives us some neural, psychological, soulful, spiritual networking, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. To be able then in those seemingly magical moments to come up with some new inspired moment that then we can act upon. Yeah. Yeah. Now for me over the years and the people that I work with who are high performers, they ultimately learn to set up conditions to be able to create at will, to retrieve their childhood at will. You know what I mean? And and that can be so individual. How do you work with the constraints of your, your life circumstances? But how do you shape time? How do you redirect your attention? How do you create 90 minute blocks where you like everything else is gone and your mind is fully focused and in flow though that requires usually some setting up conditions to make the muse appear at will. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? It, it makes it makes all the sense in the world. So I was, I'm was, kind of approaching it both from a, you know more of a, a pragmatic point yep. of view to really help people like actually know that it's possible for them to create at will. It's, not, what, you know, it's imperative. Yeah. And, and, and the thing is too that uh, and everyone listening, I want you to understand is like I'm not saying that you have to tap into Steven Spielberg's well or Steve Jobs as well. Those are their wells. Uh, their, that's their flow. That's their, that's the thing that they get, that they're able to tap into. You need to find out where yours is and how to tap in in yours. And now we're getting really deep, but sometimes and Spielberg said this so beautifully. And I think I have a print story too, that illustrates this as well, where Spielberg says ideas float around the universe. And when they come, they'll come to you. If you don't do something with it, it will leave you and go somewhere else. And that he's had so many times where an idea has come to him. He's like, nah, I won't do that. And like a week or two later, someone's announcing that exact same idea. Like, why is it all of a sudden we had Armageddon, Deep Impact, all these movies show up at the same time? Why did, you know, the exact same sort of volcano movies all of a sudden became hot? Or there was something that popped in all of us. And Prince, I heard this wonderful story about the late great Prince who said uh, he would get, he, he had, he, I don't know if you know this or not, he has 8,000 songs done that were in a vault through his life that never got released, ever, ever got released. So he has an album up until the year 3000. He'll release a wow. new album up until the year 3000. He will be releasing music. That's who Prince was. But yeah. he had people on call all the time 
when the muse hit him. And he one day called up one of his backup singers and said, hey, uh, hey, what are you doing? He's like, uh, Prince, it's three o'clock in the morning. He goes, yeah, yeah, I need you. To, I need you to come down. We need to record. And she's like, but but it's three o'clock in the morning. She's like, I got to get this out because if I don't, Michael Jackson's going to take it. <laughs> <laughs> it is such a beautiful way of looking at it. You want to talk about someone who have wondered, Jesus, look at Prince's yeah, yeah. career. But people like Prince and, and others, they pay attention to their innate capacity right. for those sort of goldfish ideas. We all have that capacity and we all can retrieve that capacity. And there are different tools, meditation being mm -hmm. one of them. Huge. Constantly, you know, every day writing in the morning just to see what is in that murky mind. These are all ways of, of learning to be in wonder with one's own mind. It's, it's a mystery, the mind is. And these people, like Prince and Spielberg and others, have honed the ability to pay attention to and capture those ideas, those inspirations. That's the difference. We all have them. There are goldfish floating past the aquarium of our awareness constantly, all day long. But have we set up the conditions to actually observe them and capture those goldfish? Oh my God, that's an amazing analogy. I've never, there's such a visual analogy that you're absolutely right. Most of us walk through life seeing the fish go by and there's a handful of us who've been able to go, oh no, shh, shh, no one sees that. Let me just grab that. <laughs> I better I, capture it now because it's going to swim away before I, I don't forget it. <laughs> iPhones. Okay, we'll do iPhones. <laughs> Jurassic Park. Okay, that'll be good. Uh, you know, <laughs> yeah, the, exactly. things, you know, because how, how is it that nobody on the planet thought of an iPhone? Yeah, right. Nobody on the planet thought of an iPhone and they, and they had the, the biggest and the brightest minds in the world thinking about stuff like that. And, and when, actually, of course... Before Apple, there was somebody who had thought of the iPhone and what, what, you know, Jobs was really good at was coming up in second and then doing best what somebody had innovated actually before him. Yeah. Right. But, but oh yeah, I mean, the Mac OS, I mean, from Xerox, yeah, of yeah. course, the, 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 the famous story, but the ability to take that goldfish and then repackage it and rebuild it and redo something yes. with it. And there was a kernel of an idea there, but how many people walked by the Xerox labs yes. and yes. saw that technology and actually the owners of Xerox saw that technology and said, eh. <laughs> and that inspiration yeah. is only about 3% of the whole creative process. Correct. Right? Yeah. The other 97% requires ongoing experiences of wonder to move you through from that inspiration to like, is this going to work? Who do we bring on board? You, you see what I'm saying? It's like, mm -hmm. that's like, that's what requires ongoing experiences of wonder to get you through all of the hell that I know they experienced in finally making the iPhone work. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And as, as a, as a writer, I found that, and, and I've talked to so many writers over the years and authors, um, for everyone listening who wants to write, wants to be a creative in whatever field they, um, Yeah. They um, they uh, are able to turn on the the muddy water, and they have to let the mud come through first. And you just have to write and write and write and write and write, because if not, uh, once you have that, then the mud starts and the water starts clearing up little by little, and eventually you can drink it. <laughs> Completely, yes. It's what Annie Lamott calls the SFD or the shitty first draft. You just have to. <laughs> Yeah. Gotta get it out. Gotta get it out. Gotta <laughs> yeah, get it out. It's so true. Um, now I'm going to ask you a few questions. I ask all of my guests. What mm. is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film, in the film industry, in your industry, or in life? The longest lesson to learn. That's the question. Mm -hmm. What is the longest lesson that you've that you've taken you to learn? Like the universe kept beating you with it, and you were like, "No, nope, I'm not." The beauty of patience. <laughs> that's mine. It's, that's it. That's yeah. mine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's taking me. Uh, take, I'm still learning that. Pay. I'm still learning that lesson. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, what advice would you have for somebody who wants to find that wonder, wants to mm -hmm. be able to connect to that creativity, and is having trouble? I would say recognize that wonder is the most pervasive yet evasive emotional experience we have. It's all around, and the first thing you could do is actually relax your eyes from hunting so much information. 
to step away from a screen and actually just let your eyes rest and pause and then gaze upon something very ordinary right around you for just a few breaths, just to really let your eyes gaze and then maybe praise. Maybe just find the words of praise for that doorknob or or the window pane. Whatever it is, really, I could almost promise you, if you do that, if you pause, gaze, and praise, something's going to shift for you. And you say, oh, yeah, actually, there are moments of wonder that pass by me potentially every day. Jeffrey, it has been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much for uh, for writing the book and making me think about wonder a little bit more than I normally do and, and actually being able to put a name to what I've been feeling this these last years. And, uh, and hopefully uh, I can tap a little bit more into that myself. But thank you so much for what you do. And where can people find the book and find out more work about what you do? Yeah. Well, first, thank you, too, for the conversation. You really do illustrate that wonder can happen in a conversation. Mm -hmm. It's one of the most beautiful places where wonder can happen. Um, So Tracking Wonder, Reclaiming a Life of Meaning and Possibility in a World Obsessed with Productivity comes out with Sounds True, probably by the time this airs. And uh, you can go to trackingwonder.com. You you also can go to trackingwonder.com slash podcast bonus, and we'll have a couple of bonuses for you. Awesome. Jeffrey, thank you again, my friend, and be well. Thank you, Alex. Take care. I want to thank Jeffrey so much for coming on the show and dropping his wonder bombs on the tribe today. Thank you again so much, Jeffrey. If you want to get links to anything we spoke about in this episode, including how to get his new book, Tracking Wonder, head over to the show notes at bulletproofscreenwriting.tv forward slash 149. And if you haven't already, please head over to screenwritingpodcast.com, subscribe, and leave a good review for the show. It truly helps us out a lot. Thank you again so much for listening, guys. As always, keep on writing, no matter what. I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast at bulletproofscreenwriting.tv. 